and hello to those watching online and great to have you here in those who are here in person and we are moving more things online so that we'll be ready to help care for everybody and I'm encouraging you to make the most of the opportunity of online resources. I've already talked about our daily devotions that we have and uh, we're going to have some kids resources and things available but for you who are adults it's also an opportunity that maybe you get a chance if you end up not being able to go to work or having to self-isolate, that you're going to have a chance to be able to do some more uh, online courses. So I'm going to send you some links um, for the More College online courses, um, some fabulous courses, and it's going to give you an opportunity possibly to be able to smash out a couple of those in the next few weeks and uh, to grow in what God is teaching us all. Anyway, more of that you'll find. Uh, I'll keep in contact. Let's pray and come to God's Word here in Revelation chapter 5. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for today. We're thankful that we can gather here. We're thankful that you are with us and that you speak to us. And we pray that you might be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, given all that's going on in the world, lots of people certainly are asking, is this the apocalypse? And in God's timing, as we've been seeing over these last few weeks, we are here in the book of Revelation. It's been tremendous because God, uh, in the book of Revelation, shows us the world as it really is shows us the world, past, present and future, shows us ultimate reality, showing us that we can conquer, we don't have to compromise because Jesus has conquered. Whatever challenges we may face, Jesus has conquered. Whatever challenges are before us, be they a global pandemic, apathy, affluence, immorality, suffering, persecution, Jesus has conquered. We've been learning week by week in this series how we can have confidence and hope because Jesus has conquered for us. And last week in particular, as we came to the grand vision of Revelation chapter 4, the second vision in the book of Revelation, we began to see what ultimate reality looks like and what my life is for and where I find meaning and purpose. Where do I fit in the bigger scheme of things? And we thought last week, if only we could just look into heaven, if only we could just see what God has planned for us and for the world. And we open the book of Revelation chapter 4 and we see the door is opened. And last week we began to see the Copernican revolution that, that happens in our hearts and our lives when we see that Jesus is standing at the door, he knocks, he opens the door, and we come in and we can gather around the throne of God singing together together with all of creation, you are worthy, our Lord and God, because to receive glory and honour and power for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. This grand picture of God, the creator and ruler over all things, was the, how the vision began. And chapter 5 of Revelation is the climax of this great vision. Today, in chapter 5, John sees God, the creator, sitting on the throne, and he's got this scroll in his hand. He's got a scroll. Verse 1, Then I saw the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And here contained in this scroll that God is holding on the throne is his plans for the world. Here are his plans and purposes. But it's all sealed up. It's written on the inside and out, but it's completely unable to be read or open or implemented. You know, like uh, the prophets Isaiah and Daniel, Ezekiel, as we've been seeing through the book of Revelation, someone asked the question, well, who is worthy? Verse 2, I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? Who is worthy? to read out the plans and the purposes of God. And in verse 3, you'll see the disappointing response. No one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. Verse 4, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. But John who was weeping and weeping and weeping because of the sadness and the evil of our world and the brokenness. He's wanting to see God's will in, uh, on, done on earth as it is in heaven. He's weeping because no one's worthy. But verse 5, 
one of the elders says to him, have a look there, do not weep. See the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David has triumphed and he is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. You see, there is one who is worthy and he uses those, uh, those names from the Old Testament drawing on the picture of the Christ, the Messiah. There is one, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. And you can see, if you go back to your Bibles, where, those, where they come from in the Old Testament. But they're the promises of the Christ. Don't weep. The Christ will come. The Christ has come. The Christ has conquered. And so he is worthy He can open the scroll and the seals. And here is the great joy of Easter, isn't it? This is why we sing with praises to God every Sunday. This is why the great victory uh, is celebrated Sunday by Sunday, every Easter, the victory of Christ to open the scroll, to reveal the purposes and the plan of God for the world that he is putting into effect through his son, Jesus Christ. If we could look into heaven now, this is exactly what we would see. If, if, imagine if the roof of the church lifted off. Imagine if we could look straight up into heaven. This is what we would see, that Christ is ruling now. But when John looks up to see the Lion of Judah, what he saw couldn't be further from what he would have been expecting. The conquering Lion of Judah turns out to be a slain lamb not a powerful ram but a dead sheep a lamb without strength without kind of life and jumping around as little lambs like to do this is a lamb that was slain and what he sees is the great paradox of the gospel the way to conquest was seemingly to be conquered the way to glory is the cross there's nothing more shameful in the ancient world than the cross. Some of you may have seen there was a documentary, I believe, on SBS about how horrific crucifixion is. It was really the ultimate political weapon, the way to to shame people, to humiliate them. Crucifixion was a weapon of humiliation. And in the cross of Christ, in the humiliation of Jesus on the cross, we find the glory of God. It was Christ's victory, and that was the way God chose to save the world to lose his life for us. And so he alone is worthy. And as Paul says in chapter 2 of Philippians, he humbled himself, he became obedient to death, even death on a cross, and therefore God exalted him to the highest place. He gave him the name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Here's what John sees when he looks at the throne. Not a kingly lion, but a slain lamb. But look, he's not dead. Verse 6, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing in the centre of the throne. He was encircled by the four living creatures and the elders, and he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the church. And uh, as we read through the book of Revelation, horn is one of those symbols that represents power and strength. Seven eyes means that he sees everything that is happening in, in in the world and in the universe. And the seven spirits, we know, that's talking about the Holy Spirit of God, the one who died has risen. He rules with power and authority as the conqueror with the Spirit of God on the throne with his father. What a great vision we are given. And so he puts God's will into effect. Verse 7, he came and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And we come to that moment. Wow, okay, the scroll that has the plan and purpose of God is about to be opened. What's going to happen now? Now that the Lion of Judah has conquered and risen, we come to the great climax of this grand vision of heaven. The moment when heaven's rule is going to be put into practice so God's will can be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the moment. And just as he reaches out to take the scroll, 
there is this breaking out of singing in the heavens with three great songs at the end of chapter 5. Have a look there. Firstly, there's the new song by the elders, and they've all got their electric guitars. Well, you know, their harps or whatever they are. Uh, They're singing of the victory, the conquest of the Lamb, and they've got the big, you know, like, you know, I don't know what those things are, Nathan, you know, that make the distortions or distortion pedals going. They are really letting it rip. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God and they will reign on the earth. What the elders, the 24 elders, are singing as they play their guitars is explaining the dream of heaven that John's just been witnessing. The lamb was worthy to open the scroll. Why? Because he was slain. It's Jesus' death on the cross for us that makes him worthy. And it was there from the beginning. That was the purpose of God. And because He did that for us. He is worthy. His blood would ransom people for God from everywhere so that they and we might become a kingdom and priests to rule the world. It's probably one of the most fantastic descriptions of the gospel you can get. In fact, if you've got your own Bible there, I know I notice a few of you are going online Bibles, well done. Um, mark it, highlight it, underline it, circle it, print it out, do whatever you like, because this is the most wonderful gospel statement. Jesus, by his death, has ransomed us out of sin, out of that self-centered living, that Copernican revolution. From the wrath of God, he's rescued us and turned us from sinners to priests, from slaves to kings, And so he is worthy to open the seals and no one else is worthy, but he is worthy by his death and resurrection. He saves us for God for eternity. And he's seated now on the throne with all power and authority, ruling over all things now. And as we see this picture, as you know, like the roof is opened up and we we see into heaven and we hear this song and the guitars playing, We think about our own world and the things we're going through now. At the big picture level, we know that the judgment of God on earth is going to take place and that the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, Jesus has come and he is working God's plan into effect. And at the personal level, at the individual level, it challenges each of us to ask the question, am I one of the ones who has been ransomed? who used to be a slave to sin but is now one of God's kings and priests. That Copernican revolution has taken place from self-centred to God-centred. It's very personal to ask, are you one of his people singing with the elders or still living for yourself and not for him? Are you you compromising in certain ways like the churches in chapters 2 and 3 because of apathy or affluence or suffering all of these things are presented to us so that we might get such a big picture of God that it would transform us and change us personally so that we can each sing and say that Jesus is my king my savior then comes the second song and it's the song of the angels verse 12 the choir are singing In a loud voice they sang, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. It is a wonderful song, but it feels almost like blasphemy, doesn't it? I mean, hang on a sec. Chapter 4 said the Lord God was the incomparable Holy One. He's the only one who we can give all glory and honour and praise and power to and the ten commandments remember them you know you shall worship the god alone you shall have no other gods but me god won't share his glory with another and here they are giving all honor and glory and praise to this lamb who was slain now of course we know that's because jesus is god last week i asked who would you give all glory and honor and power to 
And we, in our heart of hearts, know we would not do that to any, we would not give anyone all power because we know absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the mirror, we just have to look in the mirror to know what our own hearts are like. But now the angels of heaven are singing the praises of the slain lamb in terms that should be restricted to God, showing us that Jesus is God himself. Just as we draw our breath to see what will happen, a third song bursts forth in full voice. And every creature in heaven on earth and under the earth and under the sea and all them in it begins singing, verse 13, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The Creator, the Saviour are worshipped together by the whole universe, by every creature, now and forever and ever and ever. It's the most magnificent scene. And it leaves us with two very important questions. The first one, again, is the big picture. I mean, who on earth, who, who is ruling this crazy world we live in? What's he doing about things? And the rest of the book of Revelation actually tells us how God's plan and purpose works out. But what does it mean in the world where the coronavirus seemingly has brought the world and our normal everyday lives to a sudden stop? I mean, if Jesus is in control, how can all this be? We'll have a look at chapter 6, verse 1. Chapter 6, verse 1 says, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals and then I heard one of the four living creatures say in a loud voice like thunder, Come! I looked and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. And when the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the living creatures say, Come! Verse 4, Then another horse came out, a fiery red one, and its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. See, the four horsemen of the apocalypse come and they bring famine and war and destruction because Jesus is on the throne and I'd love to tell you all about it, but we don't have enough time today, so you're going to have to come back next week. You can read on for yourselves, of course, when you go home but to see what flows out of the coronation of Christ and make sense of the world that we live in now. Not in a kind of crazy, wacky kind of way, but in a big picture, God is in control kind of way. We find hope and help and life. But while the book of Revelation leads to those sort of big picture questions, I want us to come back to the lamb who was slain on the throne the conquering Christ of heaven. And to think about what this means for us individually and our relationship with this one. Do you know what it means that you've been ransomed by him from slavery to sin to become a kingdom of God's priests forever? Do you, you, you see he rules the universe... But does he rule your universe, your actions, your hopes, your plans, your desires for your children, your everyday life, your money, your time, your retirement plans? Does the Lord Christ rule you in all aspects of your life? And can you join with the angels in heaven and sing with all your heart that you actually want Jesus to have all power and honour and glory in your life? Or do you still want to live life your way, be the master of your own destiny and choices? I think if we want to see real change in our world, we don't look to our government to give that to us. We go to our knees. Because the real government that makes the true difference in our lives is that Copernican revolution, the real change when we move from self-government to Christ's government. Let's pray. 
Dear God, I know I'm not worthy to be accepted by you. I don't deserve your gift of eternal life for I am guilty of rebelling against you and just plain ignoring you and I need your forgiveness more than anything else. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for me, to save me so I can be forgiven. Thank you that he rose to give me new life and please forgive me and please change me that I might live with Jesus as my Lord, my King, my ruler. Amen. Let's turn now to our great God in, in prayer. Sovereign Lord, you are the hope and healer of your people and have promised a world where there is no more sickness or crying or death. By your death and resurrection, you have set your people free from the penalty of sin and death. We pray your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Please prosper the work of those who are seeking a vaccine for the coronavirus. Please strengthen those who are treating the sick. Please comfort those who are mourning the loss of loved ones or living in fear of this disease. Please give to governing authorities wisdom in their management of this crisis and give to all your people your peace beyond understanding, generous and wise hearts and a renewed trust in your sovereign goodness and glory. Turn the hearts of many who are now experiencing fear and anxiety they, that they might find the peace which is the fruit of the death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name we pray. And on this uh, first anniversary of the massacre in Christchurch, New Zealand, we give thanks that the community has responded with forgiveness. We pray that out of this evil deed, hearts will be turned to the Lamb who was slain for the sins of the whole world. Most of all, we give thanks that we belong to a kingdom that cannot be shaken. To him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb be praise and honour and glory and peace forever.